Okay, um, so uh, welcome everyone to the fifth of the um, below zero uh, emissions consultation processes and these uh, workshops. And uh, this one is today on integrating below zero operations, research and teaching. Uh, so it's, it's that sort of idea of uh, that we want to, if possible, get synergies across these different elements of the below zero program. So just to uh, start things off, um, we've got a short video uh, with Paul Duldig, the uh, COO of ANU, and, uh, um, and we'll follow through once that's finished. Juliet. Hi, I'm Paul Duldig, Chief Operating Officer at the Australian National University. I'd like to welcome you to the ANU Below Zero consultation. Firstly, I'd like to acknowledge and pay my respects to the traditional owners of the land where I am today, the Wurundjeri people of the Kulin Nations. As we are all too aware, after the unprecedented bushfires, air pollution and heat that affected much of our east coast last summer, and with fire now wreaking havoc up and down the west coast of the US, climate change is already having devastating impacts all over the world. As a world leader in many areas of climate and energy research, ANU hosts over 450 climate and energy researchers and runs over 130 climate and energy related courses across the university. Our research and education programs are leading the way in developing solutions to the challenges that climate change presents. As the national university, ANU has also a responsibility to lead the nation in line with the world's best practice on greenhouse gas emissions reduction. However, at the moment, ANU activities are contributing to climate change through the direct and indirect emission of significant quantities of greenhouse gases. Further to this, simply reducing our emissions to net zero is no longer enough to maintain a safe and stable climate. To keep global temperature rises to well below 2 degrees Celsius and if possible to 1.5 degrees Celsius, we will also need to draw down and store or use greenhouse gases. In February, the ANU Council passed a resolution recognising the urgency of action required to address climate change. They also committed us to reducing the university's greenhouse gas footprint to below zero through its own operations. The resulting ANU Below Zero initiative is a vital strategic priority for ANU. It is a strong demonstration of our integrity, our emphasis on societal transformation and our commitment to excellence in everything we do. With the university's extremely difficult financial situation, this consultation process is taking place at a very challenging time. Despite the stress that ANU is under, I'm proud that we are not shying away from developing this initiative. After all, we'll be dealing with the impacts of climate change long after COVID has passed. But there's no doubt that COVID-19 and our financial situation makes the operating environment for this initiative more difficult. Transitioning the university to below zero emissions is no small task. We'll need to look at every aspect of the way that we operate. We'll need to reconsider everything from how we integrate greenhouse gas implications into our decision making, to how we use energy, how we travel, what we buy and what we eat. That's why I'm calling on all of you to engage with this vital mission. Here at ANU, we have an incredible brains trust. I encourage all of you to contribute your ideas based on your personal perspectives, as well as your research and professional expertise to help us transition to become a below zero emissions university as rapidly as possible. I look forward to your contribution soon. Thank you. Okay, well, thank you to Paul in absentia uh, and thanks to Juliet for playing that. So uh, just before we start, I'd like to acknowledge the traditional owners on the lands on who I meet, that's the Ngunnawal people and pay my respects to their elders past and present. So uh, today this workshop is being recorded and will be shared. So if you don't want your comments uh, recorded, um, submit them anonymously in the chat. Uh, function or uh, email to um, below zero at anu.edu.au. Uh, just a, a real quick uh, recap. Uh, in February, the ANU Council um, said that we've got to take more action on climate change. This is followed up with the Vice Chancellor and the Chancellor making statements about going to below zero. And uh, this is part of a process to establish that in a strategic sense across ANU. 
So there's two things which we're undertaking in terms of this consultation. Um, the first point approach is via these sorts of workshops. There's seven of them. This is number five in that sequence. Um, and as I mentioned today is really about integrating operations, research and teaching across ANU. And it's really an opportunity to lay out some ideas about the sort of uh, ANU of the future, uh, which is both a great institution in terms of its research, teaching and policy impact, but also has a much lower greenhouse gas footprint than we currently do. So this uh, consultation is open to the 20th of October and uh, we've got subsequent, uh, um, the last two of these workshops coming up. Now, apart from these workshops, you can contribute ideas through the Idea Notes platform. Uh, so there's links to that which have been sent out previously and I think uh, Claire or Juliet might put them up in the chat as well. So um, please engage as you uh, feel fit to do. Um, and to start things off today, we've got two speakers. Uh, one is Chris Brown, who's the sub-dean uh, in the College of Science and uh, works in the engineering uh, domain. Uh, and also Sophie Burgess, who's a student. <clears throat> and I'll introduce um, Sophie a bit more completely later. Um, unfortunately, our third speaker, Beck Colvin from Crawford School, <clears throat> excuse me, um, is, is unwell today and so won't be able to participate, but I think Claire DiCostello will just uh, raise a few points that Beck was planning to raise. So um, we'll open it up to the first speaker, um, Chris Brown, and uh, um, just a, a short thought starter from Chris. Cheers. Thank you, Mark, and thank you for um, uh, having, these in having these processes that allow everybody to, to bring their ideas to the table. Um, thanks also to Claire and Juliet for organising today and looking forward to hearing Sophie's notes. Um, I'd like to acknowledge that I'm coming from Ngunnawal country uh, on ANU campus and um, pay my respects to elders past, present and emerging leaders. Um, so I wanted to quickly just put out um, some thought ideas around how we structurally support the, the nexus of research and teaching um, in ways that make sense to ANU. Uh, and I'm going to put my um, vice chancellor's courses hat on. Uh, so I'm sub dean in science, but also um, convene the vice chancellor's courses, which were set up in 2009 to help interdisciplinary learning across campus. Um, they've had a bit of a, a rough period of time, but we're looking to revamp them. And we've got a steering committee that's looking to, to re-engage with them. Uh, and I suppose six points that we're trying to push across with that initiative is how do we give, which I think are really relevant to this conversation and these types of opportunities, how do we give agency to the students so that they can learn what they know they need to know um, before they leave? How do we enhance the cultural competency across, across our cohorts? Um, how do we make the learning boundaries porous across um, disciplines? How do we evolve curriculum to address wicked problems um, and doing that in a much faster way than a lot of the current curriculum um, evolves. Uh, how do we build student networks of critical friends? Uh, so this idea of how do, we, how do we let students become the agents of their, of their future and do that in a supported way? And how can we become a sort of conduit for research and engagement? Uh, and so often research is seen in the bucket over here and teaching is seen in the bucket over here, but obviously we have this amazing human capital in our students that we forget to involve in that conversation. Uh, and we're looking at structural ways we can do that. The, like the ANU Below Zero Emissions Project is a really great example of a project that um, can bring in students from a, a range of different disciplines to work on things like group projects, uh, internships, research projects from a range of different um, disciplines, uh, but there's currently very few mechanisms that allow us to do that. So if there's a student who is in the design arts who wants to do a project on climate change, it's very challenging for that student to do it unless there's a course that's specifically set up for that student. So we're looking to use the um, vice chancellor's courses as a way of engaging or a structural way to help projects like um, the Beyond Zero Emissions Project to have visibility across the across the university, um, and doing that in a way that might challenge some of the um, existing pedagogy. Uh, and so we're we're looking at how do we shift our our education from moving from evaluation to the valuation of work, 
How do we move from teaching to to learning with? How do we um, enable knowledge transmission, move from knowledge transmission to knowledge creation in our education? Uh, how do we move from learning outcomes to learning journeys? How do we move from individualistic achievement through to collective impact? I think I might leave it there, Mark, so that we can sort of build on, build on things, but hopefully that's a primer for the type of ambitious education that I think the um, Below Zero Emissions Project could be a really critical part of. Fantastic. Um, th thanks, Chris. And uh, there was a, a really substantial set of opportunities and challenges that you raised there. Um, and in fact, almost like um, completely recasting um, the, the way we um, approach things uh, across ANU and across the university sector more broadly. Um, but, but a lot of those things have really strong synergies with, uh, I, I guess, you know, some, some sort of decades of um, approaches to co-designing and, and participatory engagement um, with you know, people right across the board. And so, so I think you know, there's lots of, lots of points of intersection there with um, uh, the way some groups operate in terms of their sort of research and engagement. So it's only a great, great start there. Um, so next, um, Sophie. So Sophie Burgess is an undergrad uh, here at ANU and uh, in engineering. So we've got, got a big dose of engineering today. Over to you, Sophie. <laughs> Thank you, Mark. Um, I'm just going to quickly share my screen. Um, all right, so people should be able to see that now. Um, so thank you very much, Mark. Um, and thanks to Claire and Juliet for organizing this. Um, so yeah, my name is Sophie. I'm a third year en um, engineering student in the R&D program. Um, I'm also a current rep for KEX um, with the ANU Student, student Association um, and I have some involvement with tutoring across a few different engineering and systems engineering courses. Um, so I'm going to be talking today about um, my vision for how we can actively engage students in every step of this process um, right from the setting goals to implementation of our below zero goals. Um, so the first question, I suppose, is why involve students? Um, so firstly, we're huge active members of the community um, and many of us have a huge interest in reducing human impact on the environment. Um, a lot of us as well as another advantage are new players, I suppose you could say, to this game. Um, so with that, we'll bring quite a lot of new um, and exciting ideas that may not have been put into the realm before. Um, and finally, as well, um, being involved in the ANU Below Zero um, initiative would also equip us with skills that the whole wider community, um, country and even world would need um, so that we can tackle the larger threats of climate change. So I'm going to be talking about mainly how we can map, um, I suppose, the capabilities that we currently have, as well as capabilities that will be set up um, to these goals so that we can reach a conclusion. Um, after this below zero process, we're going to have a set of um, ideas and specific goals um, that are going to be needed to be implemented. Um, and so I'm going to talk through my vision for um, how we can reach those goals in a really student driven way. So the first step for any sort of problem is figuring out where we're starting off with. Um, so for any one of these goals, um, thinking about um, where we are at the beginning, what do we need to start this process? And so that could be any number of a different thing. We could be needing to actually set what our requirements are. Um, we could just need to be um, analyzing certain like technical um, capabilities, um, figuring out how to implement um, ideas. Um, we could be at any stage of this. Um, the second thing is figuring out who we need, like what skills we need to be able to um, get us to the next point in that mission. Um, and so that could be students from a whole different range um, of like courses and programs within the university. The second really important step is identifying what opportunities we actually have to engage with students. Um, and so I've got a list of the ones that I could think of, and I'm sure that there's so many more um, currently within the university um, that are just really out of reach um, or like out of view um, at like a university level. Um, so firstly, coursework group projects. Um, the benefit of that would be really exploring a wide solution scope, having some like divergent problem solving and creative thinking. Um, next, for more kind of like in-depth technical detail, research projects in honours, PHB, R&D programs, um, capstone courses in engineering for system level analyses. 
um, BC course projects for that interdisciplinary um, sort of analysis that Chris was touching on in his speech, um, as well as extracurricular student teams, such as the solar car team or rocketry, um, which really would be able to go from the whole stage from analysis to implementation. Once you know what's needed um, for your starting stage, um, really figuring out how you can map that to the end goal. So I've got an example here of what if our specific goal was like setting up a system to track and display electricity uses at Hancock Library. Um, so we might have our requirements as exploring available technologies and coming up with a plan to integrate. Um, and we know that our disciplines that would probably be involved would be engineering or science. Um, and so, our um, way of doing that could just be setting that to a capstone project and having a group of students go um, that entire journey. Not all projects are going to be as simple in one stage. So what happens if we have a much larger problem that we're tackling? Um, so this one is going to be bringing Cambry to below zero emissions. Um, and you can imagine that this is going to be a hugely interdisciplinary challenge. Um, so let's just say our first step is we don't actually know what the um, sources and quantities of these emissions are. Um, so we need to put that out and that could be done with an individual research project. Um, but then this doesn't get us to the final solution. So the, really the next stage in um, this process is having a system to gather results and reassess where you are and where you need to go. Um, so thinking about what was learned from that project, where are we now, and then what do we need next? And so that could lead to, um, from the findings, you could say like, all right, now we just need to put it out to come up with ideas for how we can actually um, implement um, like what we know to bring down emissions. Um, and so this could go out to a whole wide range of group projects to really get that solution scope being explored. Um, in order to implement something like this, what we'd really need is a current state analysis of what opportunities we have. So what VC courses are out there that could be used? What capstone courses are in the university? Where do we have students doing research projects? Um, a way of sharing information beyond individual projects um, so that the next project can very easily pick up the information and the data that was stored. Um, that could be via like a web page or a Waddle site or anything of that sort. Um, coming up with specific end goals, um, as well as specific intermediate stages that are required. Um, and finally, um, having some kind of working group or committee set up to review progress and reassess direction um, for all of these goals. Um, but yeah, thank you very much. Um, I really look forward to continuing discussing how we can involve students in this. Um, thanks very much, Sophie. And uh, so just uh, to round this off, um, perhaps Claire, if you just uh, fill in for Beck a little bit. Um, thanks, Mark. Yeah, look, I haven't got all Beck's notes, but I can just um, sort of reiterate two points that she made when we discussed this in advance. Uh, in advance. And Beck is the convener of the Master of Climate Change. And one of the challenges for that, or one of the, and opportunities for her students she thinks is that um, they're obviously looking at climate change at a sort of macro level um, and want to actually um, make some change, do something to, to address climate change. But looking at it at a sort of macro level is very hard um, to actually um, find things that you can do individually. Um, and obviously individual um, behavior change is really important as is kind of system, systemic institutional change. But what the Below Zero program um, can actually provide them is the opportunity to make institutional or to, to contribute towards institutional changes at a level that's a bit more manageable than looking at the whole country or the whole state. Um, so it's the sort of meeting of institutional change on a sort of more manageable level with um, individual behaviour change. And so she sees a lot of opportunity there for um, research projects um, that bring those two things together. And the second thing that the second theme that she wanted to focus on was actually um, having more focus on skills development within within that program and she also saw the Below Zero initiative as a really good opportunity to look at skills like um, conflict resolution, leadership, um, talking to well, interdisciplinary conversations, bringing different skills together, um, which in a sort of tangible way um, and that that would that would really help the students on on those those students in particular. Well, th thanks, Claire. Um, it's uh, very helpful as well. So, so 
th those uh, sort of short presentations are intended to be just uh, essentially conversation starters. And so uh, now is, now is an opportunity to sort of engage in a, a more interactive way. Um, but before we do that, um, Sally, given that you've got to head off soonish, um, perhaps uh, if, if there's anything you want to throw in or any questions you want to raise um, at this point. Hello and thank you. Can you hear me okay? Yep. Great. Okay, I've just had some technical problems. Uh, but thanks for the introduction. Thanks for the opportunity to contribute and love that um, people who are working on this are thinking about interdisciplinary ways of addressing um, this issue. So um, I'm in the Research School of Management and my research interests relate to organisational change and social impact, which includes um, environmental impact in uh, that kind of social impact space. Um, so I guess I have a research interest in this area um, and also teach courses in our school that are relevant to climate change. Um, and I know, I've, I've already spoken to Claire, and I know that you're already connected with Gary Buttress, who is also teaching in this space. Um, but I see, um, so I don't really know um, what I can contribute at this stage other than to kind of, I've already spoken to Claire and um, I think there's an opportunity to apply behavioural science to um, you know, the behaviour change that we're looking to, to bring about in, in the student cohort as well as staff. Um, and I see opportunities for research projects related to um, using behavioural science. Um, I also work with a, a couple of colleagues who use an evidence-based approach. We've developed a, a kind of methodology for using an evidence-based approach to organisational change. Um, so that's, I guess, specifically relevant to changes that we want to make on campus, um, be it amongst staff or students. Um, and that involves a kind of uh, a systematic way of identifying problems, using evidence to try and address problems and putting in place a, a theory of change that we then evaluate um, based on that theory of change. So, um, yeah, I guess I, I just wanted to kind of share um, share with you that work that colleagues and I are involved with and happy to happy to help in whatever way we can, given some of our expertise in the research school of management around organisational behaviour and um, and change. So I don't know what you're what you're looking for specifically out of this session. Yeah, uh, look, I, I I think what we're interested in is uh, you know various perspectives on contributions and how we actually go about uh, you know what is actually um, you know systemic changes uh, across ANU and and in particular some of the things that you're talking about um, I think you know do exactly what we're talking about here is which is how do you actually get real world change, but not divorce that from the research and teaching aspects? How do you actually link those things together? And which was you know, very close to what you were talking about. I think you've frozen, Sally. <laughs> yeah, you're back online now. Can't hear you though. Can you hear me now? Yep. Sorry, I don't know when I when I cut out now, uh, just then. Oh, no, it was all good. You you you'd uh, just asked the question, so I just uh, sort of responded and just said, yeah, what you what you're saying was was spot on um, in how we want to approach um, below zero. Okay. Can I can I ask a question of of you, Sally? Uh, in terms of the so figuring out that there are these projects in these spaces that could work really well and that there would be this interesting angle, I think is fantastic. How do we then operationalize that and make sure it's part of core business for people across different, who have maybe slightly different um, KPIs across their different schools around sort of their research interests or, or teaching? Yeah, 
How do we sort of systematically operationalize people doing research in this interesting space? Yeah, so I talked briefly with Claire about this and Claire suggested maybe getting a, a group of researchers um, together and forming a, you know, kind of a working group with researchers because there's someone else from psychology who sounds like she's also in this space of environmental psychology. Um, so I think there's opportunities for cross school, cross college um, research collaboration. Um, and I, yeah, I'm, I'd love to be involved in that and I can see opportunities for that. What, I don't know if that's something that you've considered well, I'm, like, I'm just thinking it'd be fantastic if there was a student research hub on this topic and, and just to give visibility to projects that might come up and whether a student might approach it as a, a six unit second year research experience or a honours thesis to sort of have that community around it yeah. with student research as the focus. Yeah, so I, I mean, I can see opportunities for honours projects, absolutely. Um, and so, you know, that might involve primary supervisor from a couple of different schools mm -hmm. across campus. One, you know, a climate scientist and a management scientist who can bring different perspectives to that research project. Um, but are we only talking about students in this session? I, I might have missed you're, you're just, Chris, you're just thinking of this from a student angle. Yeah, right? sorry. I'm, yeah. I suppose I'm thinking about it as the start of the pipeline. Yeah. Uh, because yep. I, I think um, one thing that we learned um, about student projects is that giving them six, six or three months to do a six unit project really isn't enough to think that to become an expert. No. Um, as, as they might think. So having opportunities so that a second year student might do a little project, which might turn into an honours project, which might turn into a eventually a postdoc or yeah. or something having having that pipeline pathway kind of approach um, because yeah, those, I those those institutions don't happen within our schools for this interdisciplinary space mm -hmm. they happen for the benefit of the discipline yeah and uh, i mean i i think it's students would really benefit from an interdisciplinary approach to to looking at this issue um, but I know that's not our, our current structures and mechanisms are not in place to allow that to happen. But I see that there seems to be, given the change in budget models, there seems to be more of an appetite and incentives for, for making that kind of work happen. And I know our school director has an appetite for that. Um, and, you know, we have a CBE has an internship program. Um, it's possible that there could be internship projects that are relevant to the work you're doing um, where students work on a, an industry project for the semester and have a six units or 12 units contribute to their degree. Um, and a small research project is, is suitable for that kind of internship. So happy to connect you with the group who, who work on those in CBE. All right, I need, I need to run, but um, great to connect with everyone and um, yeah, exciting to, to hear about the work in this, this space. It's, it's really good and it's um, long overdue. So I'm really pleased to see it's happening. Excellent. Thanks, Sally. All right, thanks. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye, -bye. Yeah. So, so we've got a very small group here today and, uh, and so, so um, you know, feel free to sort of interact a, a, a bit more dynamically than, than we, we normally would with a bigger group. Um, so just really uh, throwing that open to, to other comments. So for example, um, you know, Tom, you've made a, a, a suggestion about um, you know, generalizing some of the courses, uh, quite similar, I think, in aspects to what was just discussed by Sally and Chris. Um, and, uh, and the challenge for me, I think, is uh, sitting in the CCI, we're not a teaching entity, and so it's not clear how we'd actually go about that, um, those sorts of structural changes within ANU and how ANU operates in terms of its offerings. Um, 
So, so that might be one thing to discuss. Um, and the um, other one is Stephanie's, uh, Stephanie Pinalis is on, on the call. And, um, and Stephanie, after, you know, in a little while, you might want to just um, throw in a few ideas about from your experiences as well. But Tom, if you want to just engage on that. Uh, yes, first of all, have I got the microphone working? You do. Excellent. Um, yes, so in um, Kex and no doubt in other parts of the university, we have mechanisms set up for students to do projects either individually or in teams. And so we have the structure set up where we invite clients who have things they need done to briefly describe what their project is and what they need the students to do. Then we have a process for the students to negotiate the details, um, one for checking the legalities of um, who owns the intellectual property of what's produced, uh, ensuring the uh, students are covered in terms of work, work health, safety, insurance type things. And then a process for um, checking on the student's progress, checking on the client's happy and assessing the scheme and software for doing that. So we have all of that sort of mechanism set up. Um, with the Tech Launcher team projects, there have been students from elsewhere in the university uh, participating in those teams. Um, so it's possible um, for the internships, there are staff specifically employed to help hunt out projects and worry about all these things. And there's a whole, in the educational field where I am, there's a whole discipline which looks at how you go about doing these sorts of projects, making sure you meet educational requirements with it. So it's, it's, um, it's a thought out process. It takes a lot of resources from the educational end of things to set this up and keep it running. But I think we've got it so that the client end, the people with an idea need something done. It's not so difficult for them and we have to manage their expectations about what a student is capable of doing in six months or a year and um, how to treat the student. So I'd suggest um, it's quite doable. Can I, can I jump in on, yep. on that? Um, and Tom, like, I think, I think every college sort of has, has these mechanisms that allow people to do it. And I think that the tech launcher and capstone projects are, are quite, and cakes internships are quite good examples of these. One of the problems that I have with it though, is that these programs have been around for 20 years and, and fail to capture the imagination outside of the college. Uh, and so the challenge that I think we, that, that, or the opportunity that I think that is here around maybe changes to the funding model, where my understanding is that investments are going to be made strategically rather than based on student load. This presents a really interesting way of going, well, look, let's, let's capitalize on the things that are working across, across the place uh, and make it work for people outside of those, of those areas. Uh, and one, one sort of specific example around assessment that happens within these courses needs to be done in a way that's appropriate to students who aren't from those disciplines. Um, how do we break, how do we create those mechanisms so that we can have a common platform that allows students to well, do it there in are, a way? There are, um, um, I mean, this does happen in other disciplines. Um, I helped the University of Queensland um, who, with their occupational health and um, students who work in hospitals and they produced bespoke software to do that. Um, I guess my thought is this is something that would appeal to the parts of university where students are in a vocationally oriented discipline where they're used to having to produce a practical object and have that processed assessed. There are lots of bits of the university that does not excite. I guess my cynical view is with the new federal government funding arrangements, um, there won't be any funding for those other bits of the university. Um, so 
they will have to either get into this business of producing more practical things yeah. or go out of business. So that might get their excitement in practical terms. Um, and it is possible, I mean, even in, in more arts areas, I think, to do this sort of thing, because they're used to producing uh, a piece of work, be it written. Um, in terms of getting their excitement, um, I think the external drivers will cause that to happen. It, as long as we have a, a process where they can make use of it. Thanks. Sophie, just in relation to, to that, you know, like how, how do you respond to those discussions and suggestions from Chris and Tom? Well, firstly, like all of my background is in um, the like engineering space. So I don't have much of a view of like what other colleges um, do, but I, I definitely agree that there needs to be more scope for interdisciplinary projects, but I'm not sure if um, like opening up existing ones that are like, like discipline focused to just become like interdisciplinary is necessarily the best way to do it because you might lose some of the like projects we need like a technical expertise in a certain discipline it's needed that you have a place to go to to get that as well as a place to go to to get a more like holistic interdisciplinary approach um the one issue that i have with um like six unit projects um is um in terms of like capstone projects is it doesn't seem to be a good way that information is then passed on to future years who then take up a similar project so um i know in like some capstone courses there have been a few that have been going continuously for a few years so i'd be interested to hear about how they deal with it um but i know in terms of like connecting a research project to a capstone project it's often a matter of just kind of going hunting for the person who did that original one and getting information from them um, so that's the main challenge that I see is like, or like one of the challenges that would also need to be identified to be able to use those sort of programs efficiently. Yeah. Hey, thanks for that, Sophie. So, um, Stephanie, any reflections on this? Yeah, so I had quite a unique internship experience in the fact that it was all online. Um, due to COVID and so my reflections may not be um, as rich or as detailed as if they were in person but yeah it was overall a really really positive experience I mainly performed a critical literature review and it was very multidisciplinary um, but I think that does owe to the way that my course in environmental management and development is already kind of set up especially because it's postgrad um, and yeah, and so I think the real positives and the strengths of that internship and what was key to actually the success of it was the fact that the internship was always kind of grounded in the practical implications and the potential practical results of it. Um, for example, just knowing how it would contribute to the A New Below Zero initiative and whatnot. And I think um, finding a way to instill that kind of imperative or um, practical employability and real world application of this research of these research projects and internships is actually really key to attracting um, students towards it kind of um, reorienting it away from something that's grades based which you know is what a lot of university students are dominated by and instead um, turn it towards real world applications which is what is really important and the key learnings, just based off what everyone else has said, the key thing for me, um, I think it would be really good to have what, I think what Sophie had mentioned about the information sharing base, having something out there that's very accessible to other disciplines, and also maybe um, having something similar to, I don't know if it's in all colleges, but maybe something like the academic skills courses um, in relation to um, higher degree kind of research experiences. For example, um, some of my most valuable meetings with Claire, um, since she was my supervisor, were when she um, kind of talked me through dealing with politically sensitive issues and trying to resolve um, 
trying to resolve or address kind of political conflicts through my writing. And that's really a kind of issue and writing skill and communication skill that I hadn't had to develop before. So maybe if there was a similar kind of academic skills um, in relation to dealing with these kinds of higher research and complex world issues, I think that would be really valuable. And if these academic skills, I don't know if it's all around the university, maybe this is already a quite useless suggestion, but yeah, I, I've only experienced the Crawford one. And so I'd assume that they're quite um, specified to each um, college. And, but yeah, that's pretty much it for me uh, based off what every, everyone else has said. Yeah, uh, thank you, Stephanie. So, so one one of the challenges I think is that the, the sort of case for, you know, um, having a sort of a interdisciplinary and cross disciplinary um, sort of capability, which which does these sorts of linkages, seems desirable. But at the moment, we've got um, you know multiple mechanisms which don't really talk with each other very effectively, and. And, and whether in fact, maybe under under the Below Zero program, there is an opportunity to actually, you know, find a, a venue and, and, and a purpose, like a specific focus um, to actually do that more effectively. Absolutely. I think the initiative is a really big opportunity to um, create linkages across the university that may have not been there previously, mm. or that have been um, limited over the years. Um, one thing that sounds like it's sort of coming through is that that needs to be resourced effectively, um, that actually managing this and um, making sure um, that there are pro new projects coming on and that it's being communicated well. Um, and some of that's quite simple. I mean, we could, uh, you know, in designing the Below Zero website, we could just um, have a whole section on student projects. So basically new student projects that we're looking for. And then also student projects that have already been completed so that it's not just all going out into the ether. And that could be one of the, and potentially we could look at, you know, some sort of prize every year for the, for the student, student project as well, like the vice chancellor's prize for the best below, you know, contribution to ANU sustainability. So I think that's just something we need to plan for, but it sounds like the, the research projects and internships um, within colleges require a bit of resourcing just to get them set up already. And, um, I mean, that's what you were saying, Chris. So would you have any suggestions there in terms of? Yeah, so I suppose we're, we're trying to break the university in a whole bunch of different ways and uh, having a lot of trouble doing so. Um, the, I, I think you have to work with what you've got. Uh, and so every college has an internship program. Every college has capstone courses, but their purposes are slightly different. Uh, and it might involve shopping around to some of those and going, well, look, the CBE project that's running, the special industry project that's running there, that this could be a really good good project there. Maybe you could get a team in, in Tech Launcher. Maybe there's um, a focus we could have in School of Art and Design. And so, so you've got to reach out, but also that brings a lot of benefits with it because people um, who are running those courses can then talk about these excellent things that they're doing across campus. It's one of the things that, um, that brings value to them. Um, and then also having a set of mechanisms that allow students to, to cross those disciplines. So Stephanie's um, innovation internship, where there wasn't necessarily a structure for her to do that, but could then use it um, to, do, to achieve the goal. So I think it has to come from both, both sides. Um, and it would be really nice if we talked to each other a bit more around, around how we can benefit um, from, from each other's knowledge and, and opportunities. Um, but I think definitely trying to create a vibrant hub around the projects and get that visibility would help would help the stream. Uh, and I'm not sure if you've seen it, but a good example is the Center for Entrepreneurial Agritech. Um, so they've been quite effective at pushing their relevance out to other disciplines, which has then meant that they're a staple in capstone projects and research and honors projects and internships. Um, and so maybe there's a little bit of effort that needs to go into getting the word out, but then like once, once it's there, we can go, well, what's, what's the innovation internship for this, for the um, initiative this, this semester? What's the next one? What's the next one? And start that pipeline. Yeah. Oh, it sounds, sounds good. I think like there's starting to be a few 
you know, a bit of uh, gelling here. Um, uh, um, um, the, the challenge in particular, of course, is, is um, a combination of resourcing plus the, uh, the uncertainties associated with um, Commonwealth legislation, uh, which, which make throw a huge doozy into mm. you know, how we organise ourselves and how we fund ourselves. Um, yeah, so, so most of the people I think on the call have actually had a, um, an opportunity to comment, but not Phil, if you, as, as, as a reliable um, attendee to these, um, uh, have you got any particular views on this? Well, the short answer is uh, not really. Um, I, <laughs> uh, I'm, I'm up at Mount Stromlo, as I've said before, um, and so I'm quite disconnected from the main campus anyway, so I'm not, like a lot of this operational stuff I don't know about. Um, and I'm also only just at a stage in my career where I'm starting to have teaching experience. And so I'm not really very familiar with any of this at all. Mm. But it's, it's like the, the, one of the reasons I came to this and um, all the other workshops is, is to learn as much as it has been to, um, to contribute my thoughts. Um, so no, I'm, I'm quite happy in this one just to sit back and, and listen to everyone, the people with much more knowledge and experience than me. But thank you. That's okay. Uh, no, I, I guess uh, it, it may have been, you could have actually said, well, you know, these are the sort of uh, um, like capstone type projects, uh, the practical um, sort of projects uh, with some depth in them may, may actually be, you might have said, gee, those are the sorts of things that really excite me, or I, I may have some colleagues um, uh, sitting up at Stromlight who'd be really excited um, in terms of that as well. So it was more of that. I have to, I, I'll admit, I, I haven't actually heard of these capstone projects before today. Um, so, yeah, no, I'm... Yeah, <laughs> sorry. So in that case, it's been, a, been a, an educational process in its own right. I mean, ANU is a big and complex beast. Um, yeah, okay. So I, I guess um, we've, we've still got a few minutes to go, but I don't want to extend this unnecessarily. Um, um, possibly just uh, any, any wrap up comments from people? I think the key point there was getting the communications channels open across the university. Um, and it may be that if you have um, a list of relevant energy projects and can identify what the relevant capstones and internships and teamwork project things are called in the different bits of the university and can even say, hey, that college, why did you get some of your students? You've got that thing to work on our project with the people in the other college and the, they have an equivalent that might be how to get this started without having to set up a new central standardised um, set of courses. Yeah. Um, maybe to operationalise Tom's idea, there is an internships community of practice where, and there is also uh, almost an interdisciplinary, a projects, group project community of practice almost um, in existence, which I think if, if you did have a list of projects or thoughts or and they have regular meetings as well and even just coming to those, yeah. um, I know internship, like in the science internship program, we have about 45 applications for about six or seven spots. Uh, and so there is massive demand for students to work on these sorts of projects. I, I know that Kex has a much bigger project, uh, uh, um, Pipeline and, and CBE is just out of this world, but I'm sure that if projects were there that they would be filled. Um, and, and I suppose we want to work with whoever the host is to make sure that those projects are going to be successful and deliver value back to, back to the, the host. And so um, I think I'm, I'm more than happy to put my hand up and help operationalize some of that um, because I see this as such a valuable opportunity for student projects over the next five, 10, and and Claire put up that idea of the living lab. This is our campus. This is something that we can actually have have impact on. Uh, I think it sounds like a good pathway through. And 
and, and possibly, uh, you know, engaging with those communities of practice sounds like a, a good pathway. Um, you, know, you know, one of us sort of giving a presentation, engaging with them, uh, um, you know, outlining uh, some of the drive from the university executive, et cetera, so that, that it sort of identifies this as an area where there's prospective activities. Uh, and, and of course, um, down the track, you know, there's you know, potential um, resourcing implications, uh, which I think we'll be looking at as, as part of pulling together the various ideas um, that, that emerge from this uh, uh, consultation and ideas generation process. Well, the internships community practice meets tomorrow, so I'll pass on. I'll pass on that you're coming to the next one as a agenda item. Okay, no, that sounds good. Yep. Happy to do that. That'd be great. Yep. Okay, so are there any any last comments here? Um, one last thing that I wanted to um, touch on, or I suppose like see if we can um, explore further in the future, is um, we've had a lot of conversations about how we can um, like start like communication bridges between like um, like projects and like like capstone sort of um, like courses. Um, one of the things that I think is really important to um, see if we can really utilize is like so many courses do like small group projects where they look at like case studies and really kind of like come up with a lot of different ideas. Seeing if we can have a mechanism to get potential goals out there so that like courses can use like the data that we're trying to work with to like come up with ideas and really try to gather um, all of the thoughts that come out of those spaces. I think that that would be a really useful space to tap into. Okay. Yeah. That's a good suggestion, Sophie. Thanks for that. Okay. Any last words? Just thank you very much everyone and Chris will definitely be coming back to you to now that you've volunteered to try and like um, craft this as well and and you Sophie as well thank you for your presentations okay. and everybody's contributions as well fantastic and uh and, and Stephanie and uh, thanks thanks Claire and, and just uh reminding us we've got um our last two um uh um consultations are coming up um Claire well I haven't actually got them uh, uh we've got one on Tuesday next week about I think it's Tuesday yeah on about finance. um yeah. finance so find it how we can finance this purchasing and also investments in the context of um, uh, Cambridge last week announced that they will be divesting of all fossil fuel, indirect and direct, so not just direct investments in fossil fuels by 2030. Um, and then we've got a final one with the Vice Chancellor and the Chief Operating Officer on the 15th of October. Um, so that's a really important one to try and um, emphasise the level of ambition that is required to um, to reach below zero emissions. Fantastic. Thanks, thanks, Claire, and thanks, Juliet, for putting that slide up. Um, anyway, and uh, thanks, everyone, for participating. I think uh, even though it was a small group, I think there were some very useful discussions and, and practical suggestions about moving things forward. And uh, so it was really helpful from everyone. So thanks again, and we'll see you next time. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.